Well, good morning, Gospel City Church. How's everyone doing this morning? Good? All right. Average, average. Grab your Bibles and uh, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3 this morning. Genesis chapter 3. We've made it to the first or the third chapter of the first book in the Bible. If you haven't been with us, and I don't presume that everybody here is a regular, and so welcome if this is your first time at Gospel City. We've been venturing through verse by verse the book of Genesis, and so we took about six weeks to look at Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And the more we have studied Genesis chapter 1 and 2, I would recommend that you take some time to read it if you haven't been here with us over six weeks. It is a magnificent telling of the creator of the ends of the earth and how creation began and how your life began. And the more we study Genesis 1 and 2, the more we should find ourselves returning to the creator. It's in the first two chapters of Genesis that we see the ownership of God on display. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He is the only being outside of time and space. He alone is holy, 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 and he is ruling and he is reigning in unapproachable light. And the light that he reigns in and dwells in is, of course, his glory and his perfection and his otherness and his righteousness. And we were created to be holy as he is holy. We are created in the image and likeness of this God to walk in harmony with him. We were created to worship God because we are the creatures and he is the creator. And while his face was fully turned toward us, our faces were meant to be turned toward God as we subdued the earth and had dominion on the earth and displayed his glory around the world. Well, it's Today that we come to the third chapter of Genesis and it's here that it's as if a masterpiece has been completely destroyed. It'd be like me introducing you to the Mona Lisa only to find out that two five-year-olds came along the next day with their own paint set and painted over it. Or we just toured the Taj Mahal. All the beautiful architecture and the ins and outs and only to find out the next day that it burned to the ground. And in Genesis chapter 3, we see the destruction and the distortion that is caused by sin. And the big thing that I want to draw out of the text, I think it's central to what we see in Genesis chapter 3 regarding the fall of mankind. This is the big idea. Take God at his word or live and die in sin and shame. Take God at his word or live and die in sin and shame. It was true then, and it's a warning to us here today as we look at the very serious topic of sin entering the world. So let's get our eyes on a copy of Genesis chapter 3 together, and we'll read verses 1 through 13 in the house of God today. Now hear the word of the Lord. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be so desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Verse 7, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves among the presence of the Lord God, among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me. She gave me the fruit and I ate of the tree. 
Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Let's pray together. Father, if any passage in the Bible deserves a a bit of a serious tone, it is this one. And so, Lord, I pray that in our time together today, we would strike the somber tonality that should be a result due to the sin of mankind, due to the sin that has cursed the earth. And Lord, we are are grateful to sing and be reminded this morning of the glorious hope that we have in Jesus Christ. But Lord, we're also blessed this morning to be reminded of where we have come from if we are in Christ or where we need to be if we are stuck dead in our trespasses and sins. And so Lord, my my flesh or my spirit desires you to just move powerfully this morning. I, I desire for your spirit to break hard hearts open. I desire for your spirit to reveal deep and dark things in our hearts that are not of you. Lord, my spirit, I I desire that you would penetrate the secret places of our hearts and reveal to us the wickedness of our souls apart from the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, in our short time together this morning, I pray that we would recognize the power of your voice, the power of your word that was given in the garden and has never returned void since that day. And, Lord, I pray that your word this morning would not return void as it goes out to our ears and hopefully to our hearts. Would your spirit impress upon us the seriousness of sin, the opportunity to repent and believe, and the invitation to live in the light of his glorious grace. Lord, we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Now, this week, as we come to Genesis chapter 3, I have contemplated a bunch of different questions. I've, I've, I've asked the question this week, why do bad things happen in the world? Or why is life so sad sometimes? I, I've caught myself asking, what is wrong with some of the people in our society? I've asked the question, what's wrong with me sometimes? Why can't I get victory over little things or little attitudinal things in my life. I've had the thought about the idea, if God is so good and and all powerful, if he is Elohim and all sovereign, then why do marriages seem to often fall apart? Or, Or why do babies die? Why is miscarriage even a thing? Or why does he let children go prodigal from their parents? Or why is cancer a battle that many wonderful friends and family have to face? Or, or how could a young boy be diagnosed with leukemia or a mom battle chronic pain for years with only a desire to be active and present with her kids? Or how could a young girl's innocence be stolen through abusive, perverse efforts? Maybe you've thought about this if you, as you've watched the news. I've heard different people asking these questions. Why are women and children being raped, kidnapped, and killed and burned by wicked, evil terrorists in Israel? We don't have to look very far to recognize that the world is broken. I would venture to say that you could look at the circumstances and the happenings of your life yesterday and recognize that there were imperfect unbalanced and sad and maybe even shameful things that accompanied your life. Not only is the world broken, but everything is not as it should be. Planet Earth, whom God set his affections on in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, no longer exists fully turned toward Elohim. Rather, it is plagued with death and decay 
Because the image bearers made to keep it and subdue it replace God's desires for their own desires. Genesis chapter 3 in your Bible is the careful telling of why the world is the way that it is. Why suffering? Why pain? Why sickness? Why disease? Why death? We see today that Adam and Eve did not take God at his word, so sin and shame became the new reality for all who would be born from that point forward. So look at verse 1 in your Bible, Genesis chapter 3. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. So right out of the gate, in Genesis chapter 3, we're introduced to a bit of a new character. And, and remember, Genesis is not answering all of the questions that you maybe have. It's not answering all of your scientific questions or all your uh, age questions or all your questions probably pertaining to where did this serpent actually come from. But Genesis is a book about beginnings. So Genesis chapter 1 told us about the beginning of Creation And Genesis chapter 2 told us about the beginning of humanity, male and female. And Genesis chapter 3 tells us about the beginning of the perfect creation's fall into sin. But right out of the gate, we see this massively peculiar character introduced to us. We're introduced to a serpent, which is another name for a snake. And yet the language that's used to describe this snake is this ambiguous word. It says that it was more crafty than any other beast of the field. So God is drawing a distinction between this particular serpent and, and the rest of God's divine creation regarding the animal kingdom. It says that it was crafty. And, and so the word crafty means it's clever at achieving one's aim by indirect or deceitful methods. And so you ask the question, how can a snake be crafty? I mean, yeah, I don't like snakes, and they slither, and they're quiet, and they wrap around you, and, and I guess you could describe them as crafty. But look at verse 1, it goes on, more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman. All right, now we're getting somewhere, because not only is this snake described as crafty, it is a talking snake, which should have been a, a, a red flag to Adam and Eve in the garden. Like they had already come by all of the animals and all the beasts of the field had, had come by and Adam named all of the beasts of the field. He had come across all of the animals and they had not come across a talking animal to this point. Uh, it should have been a red flag. They were meant to have dominion over the animals not have conversations with the animals, and yet here we are introduced to a talking snake. When I see a snake, I run the other direction. If I see a talking snake, I'm burning the joint down. <laughs> not Adam and Eve. So, so it's from the craftiness and the content of, of the conversation that's about to be had and the results that follow that we can draw our conclusions that this is none other than the Satan himself. This is Satan. This is the diabolos, the devil, the deceiver of the brethren. And what you have to understand, and you let the rest of Scripture give us some of the answers. In the back of the book, we find some answers about who this serpent is. But Satan was a fallen angel. In the book of Revelation, he's described as the serpent of old, seen as a dragon in the heavenly places. Michael the archangel kicks him out of heaven along with a third of the demons, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 tell us about his heavenly position and power and his prideful, wicked fall. But Satan, originally called Lucifer, he was created to be a worshiper of God. He was a warrior angel in the throne room of God. He was often referred to as the day star or Lucifer, which meant light bearer. Uh, he was called the son of the morning and his beauty shone brighter than many of the other angels. He was very beautiful and very powerful, but he took his beauty too far. And like we're about to see humanity do in the throne room, Lucifer thought it'd be better for him to be God rather than to worship the one true God. And this self-righteous pride that welled up in this creature meant to 
praised the creator got him booted out of heaven. Isaiah chapter 14, 12 through 14 describes it. It says this, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will make myself like the most high. Dangerous words from one who is meant to worship the creator and pride may be the most dangerous root of sin. And while Satan has fallen... And while Satan has been cursed to the earth, he came leading a rebellion on God. He disguises himself still to this day as an angel of light, leading a third of the angels now known as demons. And the battleground where he began his holy cosmic war was God's perfect garden. And he was disguised as a crafty snake. So it's with that context that we see why Eve is drawn to this serpent Throughout Genesis chapter 3, Satan's alluring, Satan is a tempter, and Satan is a master manipulator. Which leads us to point number one from the text, and it's this. God's word was doubted and twisted. God's word was doubted and twisted. Big idea. Take God at his word or live and die in sin and shame. And the first thing that you see Satan doing... And happening in Genesis chapter 3 is God's word was doubted and twisted. Verse 1 goes on. The serpent said to the woman, did God actually say? Satan's first words to the woman planted seeds of doubt in God's perfect inerrant word. And Satan wants you focused right there this morning. Did God actually say all of this? Did God actually say that? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me? Did Jesus actually say, if anyone would follow me, he must deny himself and pick up his cross? Did Jesus actually say, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers? See, Satan wages war by getting humanity to doubt God's perfect word. And in verse 1, he goes on, Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? (laughs) And, And the crafty thing about what Satan says is God didn't actually say that at all. You, You see the crafty way Satan pulls this woman into conversation. He asks a question, twisting what God actually said. And Satan wants you to doubt God's word, so he will often use it against you. He knows God's word sometimes better than us, and he'll speak it just to prey on our finite intellect. Satan knew very well what God asked of the woman, but he knew how to twist what God said just enough to get her to take the bait of the conversation. And then verse 2, and the woman said to the serpent, she was in, and she said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree." That is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So Eve answers the serpent, aiming to correct the twisting of what he asked of her. But in her attempt to interpret what the serpent was asking of her, she begins to twist God's word herself. And that's what Satan does. He gets God's word wrong just enough that we get it twisted And so just to be clear, let's look at what God actually said in Genesis chapter 2, 16 and 17. It's on the screen. But this is the instruction that Yahweh gave to Adam, who was meant to lead in the garden. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die." Now, let me draw some things out of of verse 2 and and Eve's response to the serpent. Eve replies, not using God's personal name, Yahweh. Satan didn't use God's personal name, Yahweh. Satan spoke of God as this distant, non-personal God, and Eve responded the same way. God is 
beyond time and space. I'm not walking and, you know, I'm just kind of nonchalant. Eve minimized the abundance of goodness and provision that God provided in every tree of the garden. You, did you catch that? What God said to Adam, you can eat of every tree freely in the garden. All of these trees, thousands of pieces of fruit, hundreds of trees. God supplied all of their needs in rich, fulfilling, blessing, and abundance. But Eve, she leaves out the every tree, and she replies, we can eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. And I just think about that. I was thinking about it this week. Isn't it like us to minimize all that God has given us, the abundance that God has given us, and, and this is where sin often creeps into our lives. Romans 1.21 says this, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give what? Thanks to him. That's your part. Or give what? Thanks. There we go. You're here. Or give thanks to him as God, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So God says in his word, I shall supply all of your needs according to my riches in glory. And then we complain about what we don't have. Or we grumble over what we did not receive. The book of James says every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And yet we get entitled attitudes like we deserve something more. So a lack of thankfulness is always a breeding ground for doubt and disobedience. And you see it festering even in Eve as she is, is desiring this tree in the midst of the abundance of what God had given her all around. A third thing we notice about Eve, Eve also referred to the tree's geography and not as purpose. Eve said, we can't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, but God told Adam not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So God created them in his image, richly blessed in abundance with one tree meant to produce obedience and love in humanity toward their creator. Prove to me that you love me by keeping this one command. Prove to me that, that you are walking with me and that your face is turned toward me. I'm turned toward you just by obeying this one command. And what kind of relationship would it have been? They wouldn't have needed God if there was no standard of obedience, no way that we would operate in improving our love to the creator who is in charge. And he says, you will never know evil if you never eat of this one tree in the midst of absolute perfection and abundance. So Eve minimized the purpose of the tree and just referring to its geography. And then finally, Eve added that they weren't even to touch the tree, which seems to be in addition to what God had said. But the point is this. Satan began to get her to doubt God's word, twist God's word, and question it all together. And this is where sin often starts in all of our lives. What God said matters deeply and it is able to keep you from sinning. So hide it in your heart that you might not sin against him. Look at verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Satan spreads doubt about what God said would happen. You will not surely die. God said that. Satan Lies because Satan is the father of lies. And then Satan, he twists God's motives here. Satan paints God as this jealous, pride-mongering God who doesn't want anyone competing with his power. If you take the fruit, you'll be just like God. God doesn't want you to be like him. God doesn't want anyone to compete with. And he says, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Now, the, the, the crazy thing about what Satan says to Eve they were already like God. They already had enlightened eyes to the glory of God. They were created in the image and likeness of God. And indeed, Satan knew that their eyes would be open, but only to the evil and death that he craved to spread on the earth. 
And so Satan got Eve to doubt her value as someone created in the image of God. How important is this? This is why we spent time on the Imago Day, because you have to know whose you are and who you are. Intrinsic worth and value stamped in you, functional purpose given to you on the earth. If you forget that all of that comes from God, then you will begin to draw your worth from meaningless things and you will begin to want to be that which you were never created to be, just like Satan. So with just a few questions and a few misinterpretations of Scripture, Satan had Eve right where he wanted her, and it's why we have to be very careful with what God's Word actually says. This is why we devote ourselves as believers to the expositional preaching of God's Word, verse by verse. What does the Scripture say? What was the author's intent? What does it mean for my life? Because Satan is happy with wrong interpretation. And Satan is happy with bad theology in your life because through it, he gets us to doubt God's goodness and be ungrateful. And he uses God's word just enough to disguise himself as good. And the twisting of his word leads us to despair. That's the results that we see. Point number two from the text, God's word was disobeyed and confirmed. First, it was doubted and twisted. Now we see that God's word was disobeyed and confirmed. Look at verse 6 in your Bibles. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was standing by and he ate. So temptation came, doubt caused curiosity And the twisting of God's word led to the first act of disobedience. And I just want you to notice the the language that Moses uses. It says, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes. Always beware of what your eyes tell you is good. Always. You've heard the, the statement that the eyes are the window to the soul. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Psalm 119, 37. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Psalm 101, verse 3. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away, it shall not cling to me. And what I want you to understand this morning is that we do not fall into deep and destructive sin. Rather, we move towards it through small incremental steps that often start with the desire of the eyes. You see it all through scripture. Rather than hating that which God has told us not to to partake in, we see it in the distance. And as it shimmers and shines in the light of this world and because of our sinful flesh, we, we incrementally and purposefully move toward that which God forbids. And it's also through the desires of our flesh. Eve saw that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Their eyes were off of the perfection of God and onto the allure of temptation. Also, their will was elevated above God's will in their life. Notice in, in verse 4, as the serpent replies to Eve, You will not surely die. Your eyes will be opened. You will be like God when your will begins to get elevated over God's will, you have a problem. When your will begins to be exalted over the will of God for your life, it will always lead to a downward spiral and decay. Not only that, they were out of the divinely created order. Eve is talking to the serpent. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And together the man and the woman disobeyed God's perfect instruction. And then we see that God's word is confirmed. Adam's just standing there passively by <laughs> as her husband is talking to a serpent who he is, was told to have dominion over. 
He was told, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. His, his wife walks right up to the serpent, has a conversation, takes the fruit, eats the fruit, gives him the fruit. He eats the fruit. What are you doing, Adam? <laughs> In verse 7, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now, God said if they ate of the fruit, they would surely die. Clearly, in verse 7, they're not dead. But while they didn't physically die in that moment, something did die. Seven verses earlier, right? As, as God gave Eve to Adam in the covenant of marriage, they were both naked and they were unashamed. There was nothing to be ashamed of. And then seven verses later, now all of a sudden they're covering themselves up. And that's because the innocence of humanity died that day. And it began a reality of death and decay written in the fabric of the universe and on every human that would ever come from the first humans. No longer would planet earth and God's most prized beloved humans walk in harmony with one another. But because the creatures elevated their word above God's word, innocent eyes were now open to embarrassment and evil. Free will was now a captive will with desires contrary to God. Harmony with God and man now left a chasm between Elohim, Yahweh, and, and man. An abundant life would now be shortened and marred by death and decay. And, and all of God's word proclaims that obedience brings joy, disobedience brings death and destruction. That's been true since the first act of disobedience in the garden. And we saw that God's word is absolutely true. Adam died, and Abraham died, and Isaac and Jacob died. And Noah died and Moses died without ever entering the promised land as his people wandered aimlessly and ungratefully in the wilderness for 40 years. David died and billions in between because God's word never returns void. And God said, in the day that you eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, you shall surely die. Leads to the third point this morning, God's word revealed sin and shame. God's word revealed sin and shame. Look at verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I want you to recognize how sad that verse is. For, for us who live in the already but not yet. For us who were singing just a few moments ago that the Holy Spirit would fill us fresh and anew. We're longing for the tangible presence of God. It was so for Adam and Eve in the garden. God was there. God was with them. God was walking with them in the garden, yet his presence that was once a comfort and security to them now brought fear and condemnation. Now the voice of God that was once their steadiness caused them to hide in, in, in shame, to feel the shame that their eyes had been open to because of their disobedience. Makes me want to ask you, do you feel shame and condemnation in, in the presence of God? Scripture says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is meant to be freedom. And yet if truth be told, many of us live in condemnation. Many of us live in shame even when it comes to our relationship with the God of glory. See, the gospel proclaims that if you are in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So we don't stay dead. We don't stay down, condemned, living in our shame of our past and our sinfulness. But the presence of God beckons us to, to bring it all out into the open, to, to disclose the secrets of our hearts, to repent and believe that we might experience the freedom and the joy that comes with knowing God. Adam and Eve hide in condemnation and shame. Look at verse 9. But the Lord God called the man and said to him, Where are you? This is Elohim. This is the creator of the ends of the earth. This is the omnipotent, omniscient, all-powerful God. He knew exactly where they were, but he needed Adam to know where he was. 
See, God is the initiator always. God is always initiating. But Adam needed to come clean. God is always the initiator, but the question is whether or not we will repent and believe. And some of us know that God is near. I, I was somewhere recently, and I just sensed that God was, was, was knocking on this young man's heart as tears were coming out of his eyes and as he was worshiping the Lord and sensing the presence of God. And I just was like, ah, if I could just reach in there and, and, and save you. And, 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 and yet he needed to recognize where he was. And often God is moving and God is present. And maybe you've sensed it here at this church and it keeps bringing you back. But what the gospel commands and demands is that you recognize your sinfulness, that you recognize your utter hopelessness apart from the, the grace and mercy of a God who's in control. And even as Adam and Eve hide in the garden, you see the mercy of God on display. Whenever she took that fruit, God could have said, I'm done with planet earth. I'm out. Never coming back, void of my presence forever. You will live and die in sin and shame. And yet God initiates. God moves toward sinful man and woman for the first time. And he says, where are you? Come out of hiding. Answer the Lord. Verse 10 of the text says, and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Verse 11, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Talk about throwing your wife under the bus and then backing her over. <laughs> Come on, Adam. Verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And it's in that small exchange with Elohim that you see the horrendous downward spiral that sin causes. In a matter of moments, after their disobedience, they try to hide from God, minimizing his lordship. They try to cover their shame, minimizing their transgressions. They blame shift, minimizing their responsibility as man and woman created to be like God. Adam blames Eve, minimizing his leadership responsibilities and the covering he should provide for his wife. And Eve blames the serpent, minimizing her responsibility to obey God and flee from temptation. As sin entered the world, their identity that was once royal became an identity of shame in the presence of God. All because sin had finally entered the world. I think it's important that we define sin. And, and question 16 in the New City Catechism defines sin like this. Sin is rejecting or ignoring God in the world he created, rebelling, him, rebelling against him by living without reference to him, not being or doing what he requires in his law, resulting in our death and the disintegration of all creation. That's sin. Sin is missing the mark. It's really an archery term that if I'm an archer and I'm aiming for the bullseye, sin means I have missed the mark. I, I've not even come close to the bullseye. I've missed the target completely. Sin is any being, inclination, thought, desire, or action that is contrary to God's word and God's character. How are you doing with that? Can you look at yesterday? Can you look at your actions this morning and say that you didn't have an inclination or a thought or a desire or an action that was contrary to God's word and God's perfect character? I can't. And as Adam and Eve sought to cover their nakedness from each other and from God in the garden that day, it served as a symbol that humanity's very nature from that point forward would be one of shame. No longer would humanity be born into a world walking in harmony with God, but every human would be born with a heart that is blackened by sin. And you see this from the earliest of ages of our children, right? A baby cries and a baby screams 
when it doesn't get its way. A toddler might, its first words might be no as it chucks a bowl across the room. A a little girl knows to clench her fists and, and clench her teeth as she gets angry. And our children learn lying and deceit and revenge and disobedience without anyone teaching them these things. And the older we get, the more our nature reveals that we are sinful and our will is held captive. That's why David, King David, proclaimed in Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So not only have we inherited a sin nature because of the first act of disobedience in the garden, but the world we're born into is not one of perfection and harmony. Rather, we are born into a world of decay, brokenness, and death. So sin is the reason for sickness and disease and tragedy and war and rape and abortion and miscarriage and gender dysphoria and murder and adultery and stealing and idolatry. And sin is a disease that each and every person on, plan- on the planet has been infected with. And just as God said to Adam in the garden, if you eat of it, you shall surely die. He says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of our sin is death. Eve told God in verse 13, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And many of us do the same thing every single day. We give in to the tempter and the deceiver, and the father of lies. And to live for your will rather than God's will is to stay stuck in your shame forever. God's presence is meant to bring freedom and joy, but sin will always cause us to hide from a God who is gracious and compassionate and abounding in steadfast love, a God who is always initiating on our behalf that we might come to him, run to him, turn to him, and fall at his feet. That's where our text ends today, but I want to leave you with a final point of exclamation. As you come next week, you see the first gospel message proclaimed in all of the Bible, even there in the garden. But I want to leave you with an exclamation point today. We saw that God's word was doubted and twisted, that God's word was disobeyed and confirmed, that God's word revealed sin and shame. And the fourth thing that I want to leave you with is this, God's word became flesh And dwelt among us. He's not left us on our own. And just as we've been looking at the beginning of history. And the beginning of mankind. And the beginning of the world. And the first words that God has spoken. In John chapter 1 when you get there. It says in the beginning. Familiar language. In the beginning was the word. (laughs) And the word was with God. And the word was God. And without him was not anything that was made that was made and in him was light and that light was the light of men. You go down to verse nine, it says that the true light was coming into the world and his own people did not receive him but to all who did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. You get to verse 14 of John chapter one and it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and full of truth. And I was contemplating this week, you know, God's audible voice was with Adam and Eve in the garden. And they lived and moved and had their being as God spoke. Sin entered the world and God's voice to God's people became God's law. And so God gave the Ten Commandments written on tablets of stone. And Israel's history knew to obey these things is to bring joy. To disobey these things is to experience death and shame and defeat. And that's written all over Israel's history. You get to the gospel and at the proper time, God sent forth his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to redeem it, 
from the brokenness and the death and the decay and sin. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And today that word points us to the perfect Savior, Jesus, who came and did what Adam couldn't do. Adam meant to reflect the glory of God on the earth. Jesus came and lived a perfect life, never sinning, never disobeying, always honoring his Father. And he crawled onto a cross that you and I deserve because of the sin that we were born into. And I just don't ever want that gospel message to grow old to your ears or your heart. Because sin is wicked. And sin is deceitful. And Satan is a manipulator. And he wants you to stay stuck and dead in your sin and your shame. But the fact that the word came to us and that the word was crucified on a cross and that the word was buried in a, in a grave that you and I deserve, the gospel declares that the word rose again from the dead and he ascended into heaven and he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And you know what his word is for us today and the already but not yet? It's right here. It's called the Bible. And just as the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the word today, the Bible today, has all that you need for life and godliness. So if you will take God at his word, you don't need anything else. You don't need a revelation. It's all right here. And if you will take God at his word, you don't have to live and die in sin and shame. In Romans chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, that's Adam, the many were made sinners, that's us. So by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. That's all who will call upon the name of the Lord. Verse 20, now the law came in to increase the trespass. The law of God, God's word written on the tablets, it only showed us that we can't keep the law, that we fall so short of the glory of God. So the law came in to increase trespass, but where sin increased, grace has abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Satan still wants your story to be one of shame and death. But God is, is a good and gracious God. God is a merciful and compassionate and loving God. He is slow to anger. And, and just as sin began to abound more and more, even from the moment that she took the fruit and she began to explain herself to God, grace abounded all the more as God pursued and as God has pursued for thousands of years and as God sent forth his son into the world to die on a cross in your place as a substitute for your sins and the gospel beckons you to repent and believe, to turn from the death and the shame and the wickedness of this world and give your life to Christ. Call him Lord. See him as Lord today. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord and God raised him from the dead, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. This can be your story, not sin and shame, but every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places bestowed upon you in Christ Jesus. God would no longer look at you and see the death and decay that is within your heart and your soul, but he would look upon you and see his perfect risen son. Turn to Jesus. Call upon Jesus. Why don't you bow your heads and I've asked Krista just to sing this great hymn over us, magnifying the mercy of God over our sinfulness and shame. Why don't you take a few moments right there in your seat or come and get on your knees but contemplate your own life. Look at your own heart. Look at your own shame. What do you need to disclose to God? What secret places do you need to allow God to come and renovate in your heart? Perhaps you need to repent and believe and put your hope and trust and faith in Jesus alone. He can save you. He can change you. He can give you a new story. 
Let's reflect together.